Okay, hello everyone. Happy Wednesday. <laughs> Thank you for joining me. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Canada Forum for Representative for the General Assembly District 62. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce organizations and members of forming committees for working to give voters in our area an opportunity to meet um, and question the candidates. Organizing tonight's event is League of Women Voters, Northwest Lake County representing Grace Lake, Round Lake Area with partnership with Mano Mano, uh, Mariposas Women's Collective, Round Lake Area Public Library, and National S Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and NAACP. Lake County Ranch. Please take a moment to learn about these organizations. Um, their information available online. And I will see them finish. Me gustaría dar la bienvenida a todos el foro de candidatos para representantes para el Distrito 62 de la Asamblea General. Es para mí un gran placer presentar las organizaciones y miembros del comité de formación que trabajan para los votantes de nuestra zona oportunidad de reunirse y preguntar a los candidatos. Las organizaciones que están organizando este evento esta noche es la Liga de Mujeres Votantes, el Condado de Northwest, representando la área de Grace Lake, Round Lake, con las asociaciones de Mano a Mano, Centro de Recursos Familiares, Mariposas Colectivo de Mujeres, uh, Women's, uh, Mariposas Women's Collective, Biblioteca de la área de Round Lake y la Asociación de Nacional para el Avance de las Personas de Color, NAACP, rama del Condado de Lake. Por favor, tomen un momento de aprender acerca de toda esta organización que hicieron mucho esfuerzo para este evento y uh, disponible información en línea. And now, hello, my name is Guadalupe Bueno. I am an organizer with Mano Mano Family Resource Center. Thank you for joining us today on this busy night. Um, Mano Mano focuses on empowering immigrant uh, families to become full participants in their community through our five programs healthy families, engaged citizens, productive parents, successful children, and democracy in action. Um, I'm excited to say that we have Spanish interpretation. Yay! Um, if you are in need of interpretation, please make your way um, upstairs, and we will help you with that. And yes, we think language accessibility is key for elections to offer transparency between all voters and the candidates. Now, all eligible voters have the ability to make an informed decision this general election, November 8th. Uh, I will now give my remarks again in Spanish and finish it off. Uh, hola, me llamo Guadalupe Bueno. Soy una organizadora con Mano a Mano Centro de Familia y Recursos. Gracias por acompañarnos hoy. Mano a Mano se enfoca en empoderar a los migrantes familiares que se convierten en participantes plenos de la comunidad a través de cinco, nuestros cinco programas. Familias saludables, ciudadanos comprometidos, padres productivos, niños exitosos y democracia en acción. Estoy emocionada de decir que tenemos traducción en español con nosotros. Si necesita ayuda, puede ahorita en los escalones y les podemos ayudar. Um, la accesibilidad lingüística es clave para las elecciones porque ofrezcan transparencia entre los votantes y los candidatos. Ahora todos los votantes elegibles tienen la capacidad de tomar una decisión informada esta elección general 8 de noviembre. Tengo el placer de introducir a nuestra próxima oradora, Dr. Sandra Lacan, desde NAACP, and I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Dr. Sandra Lacan from NAACP. Thank you. I don't know if I can follow that great presentation from this wonderful young lady. My name is Dr. Sandra Lacan. I am the president of the Lake County NAACP. I am so thrilled that I look into the audience and I see all of these voters out here on tonight. And I just cannot believe it when people say, oh, we're not interested in voting anymore. It just isn't true, is it? Mm -hmm. It is not true. If you are an informed voter, please raise your hand. Thank you. And that is why we are all here. I'd like to truly thank both candidates for being here for tonight. I've enjoyed partnering with the League of Women Voters. These ladies that you see back here will work your little hand out. That's why I stood up early because I didn't want to be late coming up to the microphone. They are just so intent in everything that they do and I love them all. I love you for being here because you are the ones who make a difference. But I love the younger people best. They were at the door greeting us. Did you see them? They gave me pencils. 
they gave me a card, and it was what, and they told me where to go because they knew that I was walking very slowly and everything. So thank you so much. It is my pleasure. We'll be seeing a lot of each other in the area. Please vote early. Please vote on November 8th. Tell your friends to vote, and then go out and have a good breakfast and lunch. Have a good night. Thank you. Hi, my name is Judy Armstrong, and I want to extend another welcome to all of you. We're so happy you're here tonight. I am a member of the executive board of the League of Women Voters of Northwest Lake County. The League is a nonpartisan organization that does not support, oppose, or endorse any candidate or political party. Our mission is empowering voters and defending democracy. For decades, the League has been an or organizing candidate forums at all levels of government as a service to the public to help them learn about candidates before voting. We are pleased that so many of you are here tonight, whether you're here in person or joining us online. We had a number of people register to join online. It is my great pleasure to introduce the organizations and members of the forming committee working to give voters in our area an opportunity to meet and question the candidates. The League of Women Voters, Northwest Lake County, representing Grays Lake, Round Lake area members, Susan Zinkle, Jeannie Kirby. Mano a Mano Family Resource Center members are Celeste Flores, Eric Yanez, Guadalupe Bueno, Mariposa's Women's Collective member is Gemma Mariscal, Round Lake Area Public Library, Cheryl Clark, and members of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People with Dr. Sandra LeConte working so well with us. We thank each and every one of them. Please take a moment to learn about each of these organizations. There is information in the lobby about them. In addition, we have many students from Round Lake High School Yay! They're helping in all areas this evening. To prepare for this event, we looked for all the contested races with more than one candidate running for office. All of the candidates in our area were contacted through informational packets provided by the Lake County Clerk's Office when filing the candidate's petition. This is a busy time for candidates, and not all candidates could participate. I would like to now introduce our moderator for this evening. She will be reviewing the rules and protocols for the night, and will be asking the candidates the questions collected from the audience. Our moderator for this evening is Carol Russ. Carol is a member of the League of Women Voters of Lake Forest, Lake Bluff. She has been active in the league for a quarter of a century and is a former president of her local league. Her government service includes many years on both, both the Plan Commission and the Architectural Review Board in Lake Bluff. She was also central in instituting the nomination process for local candidates in Lake Bluff. In addition, we have reached out to our Round Lake students and we have offered them training on how to be a moderator. They are going to, in addition to the many other tasks that they have performed tonight, assist our moderator. With that, please welcome the highly respected and dearly sought after Carol Russ and our student moderator. Well, welcome yet again, and hello. Uh, here on stage with me are two candidates are both eager to serve you in the Illinois State Legislature. So I would like to introduce right now candidate Adam R. Shores on your left and on your right. <laughs> candidate Laura Favor Dias. So thank you all. So we do always strive to bring contested elections to you and the candidates really do want to speak to your concerns. So for that reason, we've given you index cards or if you need one, just wave. One of our student ushers will bring you a card. You can write down your question. Once your card is written, just wave the card. They'll pick it up and we'll try to get to as many subjects as we can tonight. Um, 
And we're almost ready to begin. Candidates, thank you for agreeing to the ground rules. Our firm format allows the candidates to present their views without interruption. For that reason, we don't have back and forth debate. Um, they both prepared opening statements, which will be followed by your questions, and they have also prepared closing statements. We'll try to get to as many subjects as we can with the time allowed. Uh, the candidates will see paddles in the back of the room that show red, yellow, and green, which I hope is self-explanatory. Red certainly means stop, and I hope you'll finish your sentence, uh, but then we'll need to go on, and I know it's very disconcerting when we have to move on quickly and you haven't had time to finish your thought, but we do have a 90-second time limit on every segment. So we hope everybody in the room will be respectful and we expect our candidates to do their very best to be absolutely factual. And then we'll have the best candidate we can. Uh, we will begin with opening statements and the first presentation will be by candidate Laura Favor Dias. Good evening, everyone. My name is Laura Favor Dias, and I am running for state representative. I'm a mom, a former public school teacher, a Grays Lake Village trustee, and a small business owner. I'm running because I believe I have seen as a history teacher decisions made at every level of government directly impact people's lives. And I believe we need thoughtful, authentic, smart leaders in the state house and at every level. As, we mer as a history teacher, I have to point out this unprecedented moment in time that we are in. As we emerge from a global pandemic that has rocked our society, we have serious choices to make about what kind of leaders we want and what kind of values we're going to prioritize. We can go back to the same failed economic policies of tax cuts for the rich and unbridled welfare for corporations or we can build an economy that works for working families, for those of us who have been disproportionately affected by inflation. We also can choose if we want to follow the surrounding states and strip women and people of their rights to their bodily autonomy, or we can decide in Illinois we trust people to make their own decisions about their body. And we have a deadly serious choice to make when it comes to public safety. There have been 520 mass shootings in 2022. And we can decide if we're going to continue to protect the gun lobby or we're going to stand up and pass common sense gun safety legislation. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I hope you will see you have a clear choice here in uh, choosing a candidate who will fight for your values and stand up for us in Springfield. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll have a two-minute opening statement from Adam Shores. You're welcome to call Pierre. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, and thank you to the League of Women Voters and all of our sponsor organizations for putting this on. This uh, shows the power of uh, the work that you all do as community organizations to sponsor events like this. I'm really happy to be part of it. Uh, I am a 14-year resident of Lake County. I'm the dad of, of two boys who are in local schools here. Uh, I live in Libertyville now. I used to be a Grays Lake Village trustee. I've got a record of experience of doing good things for our community. And I'm running for the Illinois House of Representatives because I believe that we need a better Illinois. We have a better future ahead of us and we need to get there together. Illinois has a great history, but we've lost our way in recent years. And I think we need to find it again. I'm running on three things. I wanna make sure that we're putting families first, that we're strengthening our economy, and that we're strengthening our communities. When I talk about putting families first, to me that means recognizing that people are struggling right now with the daily cost of life and inflation at every turn. I want people to have the peace of mind that they want, the economic security they need, and the opportunity for success that they deserve. I also want to make sure that we have a healthy business environment that creates jobs and diversifies our tax base. And I want to make sure that we have strong communities by making sure we all understand we have a role to play in our collective success and that we want to make sure that we are safe in our homes and in our streets and in our schools. We're supporting law enforcement, giving them the resources they need to do their job. I've got a record of experience. I was a Grays Lake trustee, as I mentioned, and I would appreciate your vote and your consideration. I'm an independent, issue-minded leader. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your statements. Ooh, tall. Uh, thank you very much for your statements, and from time to time you see student moderators come up. We have three who will be here tonight as we move into the question portion of the 
presentation tonight. And first up will be Hilda Galindo. If she wants to come up, that would be just great. And I will now lead off with the first question, which will go to you, Mr. Shores. And I hope you two will stay seated. It will be a little easier to move back and forth that way. So the first question that we have is, what do you hear from your constituents that should be the top priorities of lawmakers in Springfield? Absolutely. Well, I've had the pleasure, I think this is on, I've had the pleasure of talking to friends and neighbors in our district for the last 10 months or so. And without a doubt, uh, the number one issue that people talk about is the cost of living and taxes and the economic burdens that people are facing right now. And we need to do some things to change that. We need to make sure that government is responsible with taxpayer money. We're finding ways to be innovative and cost efficient with the money that people entrust to uh, elected leaders without diminishing good quality of service and put that money back in people's pockets. We need to make sure that people have hope, opportunity for success. They've got financial freedom, that they can get along and do the things that they want to do to make their family grow and be strong. Thank you. And I'd like to give the same question to Laura Favor Dias. What do you hear from your constituents? Yes. So as I've also been knocking doors uh, since January, it's been a long year. Um, I can say there are three issues that I hear over and over and over again. First is property taxes and our property taxes um, in Lake County. And I think it's time to offer real solutions that get at the root causes. I am a, a former public school teacher. My boys go to public school. Public schools are so important, high quality public schools. But the reality is, is that unlike most states, in Illinois, the burden of funding those high quality public schools are on local homeowners. And we need to change that. And Springfield needs to do more of its fair share of the funding of public schools. Illinois ranks 48th or 49th, depending on the year, for the amount that um, the state actually gives to our public schools. So number one, I want to continue the work of the evidence-based funding formula that was passed in 2017, where we have seen um, an increase in state funding. Um, to continue that work and get at the root causes of our property tax issue. The second issue that I hear over and over again is women and people worried about their right to reproductive health care. We have seen across the nation because of the Dobbs decision that right stripped away and the clock has been rolled back 50 years. And women are scared and I know moms are scared when they look at the future of their daughters and their um, ability to be able to make their own decisions about their own body and their health care. And third is gun violence. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And so for question two, Ms. Galinda will come up and ask the question of both of you. And this question will go first to Laura Favor Diaz. So why don't you come right up? Hello. So the question is, civil discourage and compromise are necessary to meet the expectations of your constituents. What steps will you personally take to reduce political polarizations? Yes, great question. So, um, uh, certainly, this is a very divisive time. And I think the first thing that I will do um, is make sure that um, my constituents are receiving actual factual information. There are issues out there now that are so polarized that you can't tell the political rhetoric from the actual truth. And the Daily Her Herald um, had an article about that recently. So number one, I want to make sure that we're providing constituents with factual information. Two, I think that means uh, creating, it also means creating a strong um, constituent services office to help people navigate the bureaucracy of government and certain programs um, that the, they need help navigating. We also need to be intentional uh, with our communication um, across the aisle and make sure that we are, um, while we can go hard on the issues, we need to be respectful and create bipartisan relationships through camaraderie um, and forming relationships and trying to find common ground where we can find it. Thank you. And now I will ask, um, I would like to ask the same question um, to Mr. Adam Shore. Civil discourse and compromise are necessary to meet the expectation of your constituents. What steps you will personally take to reduce political polarizations? Great, thank you for the question. Uh, I totally agree that we need to make sure that we have good 
uh, respectful civil discourse in our political process, especially during election season where, you know, we've seen a lot of information uh, out there in your mailboxes and on TV that oftentimes mischaracterizes positions. I certainly know I've been the recipient of that. Uh, and I think that it's important to make sure that we understand that elected leaders have a responsibility to communicate with their constituents and do that openly and honestly. Uh, I've done that when I was a village trustee in Grays Lake. I enjoyed the fact that I had good, open, constructive dialogue uh, with my fellow residents and, and to talk with them about my vision and, and what I want to do to help our community grow. Uh, I also believe that there is too much divisive vitriol and rancor in our political system. And uh, we need leaders who have a record of working across party lines to get things done. I have that record. I'm proud to be supported by not only Republicans and independents, but a number of Democrats who understand not only the uh, work that I want to do and the platform that I have, but also the way in which I would lead and the way in which I would approach my job. Because I believe that that is just as important as the public policy solutions that you offer is the kind of voice and the kind of leader that you want to be. Thank you. Thank you for those answers. Uh, for the next question, you will be the first respondent, Mr. Shores. Okay. Uh, the question is, we have made some significant inroads in the state's debt and poor credit rating. What plans do you have to continue this path to fiscal health? Well, I would say that, um, first off, I think it's a little bit of a mischaracterization to talk about how well um, the state's fiscal situation is right now. It's easy to do that when you can, you know, uh, you know, rely on federal COVID relief money to do that. Um, I think the root cause of what we need to look at is responsible spending and making responsible decisions about how government should use taxpayer dollars. We need to make sure that we have a plan in place to pay down our pension debt, to not take on new spending, and to look at ways to deliver savings to people. When I was a village trustee in Grays Lake, I'm proud of the fact that Grays Lake is one of two debt-free municipalities of its size. And there's no, uh, uh, there's no you know, coincidence for that. The reason is, is because uh, we only pay for things that we have money to pay for. And it's what millions of Americans and people in Illinois have to deal with with their own family budget is you can't buy things unless you have the money to do it. And that's the approach that I believe the government should take as well. So to me, that's the, the root cause of what we need to do to be more responsible with government spending. Thank you. And the same question. Uh, what can you do about the state's debt and credit rating? Yes, so I have been pleased with the progress that we have made in the last four years. We've had four years in a row of a balanced budget, was, which was a big departure from the previous administration. Um, we have increased our credit rating um, multiple times over three credit agencies. And so I think we need to continue that work as federal dollars um, are decreasing. We are going to be getting some more with the Inflation Reduction Act. So we need to continue growing our commercial tax base. And I think the the way that we do that is through strategic recruitment of companies to Illinois using data-driven incentives. There's a huge exploding green technology sector. We already have a base of those in Illinois, Rivian and Normal, Argonne National Laboratories in Lamont, EV Box here uh, locally in Libertyville. We need to be uh, smart and strategic about using data-driven incentives with strong clawback provisions tied to job creation um, for high-skilled, high-wage jobs to expand our economy, to increase our revenue. Sure, it's easy to say that um, budgets are like kitchen table budgets, but the reality is that their state budgets are complicated, they are large, and we need all stakeholders at the table, and we absolutely can't uh, cut vital services to people, high-quality education, af access to affordable health care, regrowing our, rebuilding our infrastructure. Um, so I think the key is to continue on the path that we're on and continue to build our commercial tax base. Thank you very much. Uh, for the next question, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, you'll be the first respondent again. Uh, it, I said that wrong. This time you'll be the first respondent. And the question is, what was your experience participating in the most important events in the Spanish community in the Round Lake area? Oh, that's a great question. I love it. Um, so, you know, I was a, a participant uh, in the uh, Fiesta's Patrias um, Festival um, over in Round Lake. 
Um, I also was a participant in the Fiesta Patrias Parade in Mundelein or in the in the festival uh, that afternoon. I think it's really important um, that we are uh, highly involved in every community. Um, we need to serve all people and we need to be intentional. Um, you know, I have voter access cards um, that show people how to vote, when to vote, when to register, all relevant information, and that's in Spanish and in English because I think it's intentional. We have seen um, certain communities, under-resourced communities, we need to um, not have the same access to voting. We need to make sure everyone has the same access to voting, and we are intentional in our communication and communicating with residents in a language uh, that they understand to provide easy access. Great, thank you. And same question to Adam Shores. Sure, that, I love that question as well. I also participated in the Fiestas Patrias uh, parade here in Round Lake uh, earlier uh, this fall and had a wonderful opportunity just to talk with people and, and, and hear more about their concerns. And, and in addition to that, I've also participated in the Elotes uh, Festival in Round Lake Beach. That was a lot of fun. Uh, there's a, you know, my family likes to make fun of me because I did a stupid little dad dance that I posted on uh, Facebook for that event. Uh, but it was a, it was a fun and enjoyable event. Um, but I do believe that we need to make sure that we're responding to the needs of all communities, um, especially those you know that, that have heavily minority populations, because you have such a special uh, and unique perspective that we need to make sure we're, we're uh, responding to as well. And you know, I know when I'm out talking to people, I'm talking about the things that I believe are important for, uh, for this community here in the Round Lake area, safe, affordable communities, to make sure that you have opportunity for success, that you're given access to highly skilled, good paying jobs, that you have access to education and training to help you get those highly skilled, good paying jobs, that we're making sure that we're focused on uh, keeping your streets and your schools and your kids safe, that we're supporting law enforcement so that you feel safe and that you are safe in your home. Thank you. And the next question will be asked by Zaire Schofield. Why don't you come up to the microphone? Good evening. Um, and this is for Adam Shores. Do you support a woman's right to choose? What, if anything, would you change about the current Illinois law? Great, thank you so much. I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, you know, contrary to the thousands of dollars of uh, political ads trying to misrepresent my position, I actually believe I've got a reasonable and moderate position on this issue. Uh, I uh, am a strong believer in the principle of states' rights and, lim and limited government. And I believe that most people agree in a reasonable law on abortion that doesn't get in the way of a woman and her doctor. And I agree with that. Uh, Illinois has some of the most permissive laws in the country. And I don't believe, I believe that that law is settled. And while I might be personally pro-life, I also understand that this issue is very personal. It's very intimate. It's very complex for, for women. And I believe that these decisions should be left in the hands of a woman and her doctor. Thank you. And for um, Ms. Laura, um, do you support women's rights also? And if anything, would you change anything about the um, Illinois local current law? Yes. So um, as a mom, um, as a woman, as someone who's endure, endured a traumatic birth experience, I believe with every fiber of my being that we need to provide um, pro-choice, 100% pro-choice um, access to reproductive health care um, in Illinois. I don't think it's the job of politicians and elected officials and men to determine what a woman can do with her own body. And so if we look at uh, the federal government and the rollback of DOG, uh, we have now impacted women. Women, while we are currently here protected in Illinois, we are only an election away from those rights being stripped. And we have seen throughout the country horror stories of as those rights have been rolled back. So we, I would support putting it in the Constitution that a person has a right to make decisions about their own body. Um, yeah. And thank you, Zaire. So, uh, Laura, you'll be the first respondent to this question. Uh, floods, fires, droughts are becoming more frequent and severe, with severe impacts on both the economy and the environment. What position would you support to address these issues? 
Yeah, so I think uh, climate change and, and what you're speaking uh, about there is a great example of where we need private action and what people do on a daily basis, meeting public policy. And policy implemented at every level of government. As a Grays Lake Village trustee, I've been passionate about improving our sustainability, increasing our tree canopy, pushing the village to put on solar panels. The great thing about climate change, and there is something, is that there is hope in the green technology sector. As we focus on reducing our carbon emissions, we can create high-skilled, high-wage jobs. So I think it's a two-prong approach to climate change. We need to use the technology that we have available, that we are learning, that we are improving, like electric vehicles and solar panels. And we also need to make sure that we are preserving um, wetlands and our most environmentally sensitive lands for them to do the job that they have naturally and freely, at no cost to taxpayers, already doing in creating a clean environment. So I think it's public policy meets private action with an, uh, a, a focus on technology as well as the natural environment that we already have and making sure that we are reaping the maximum benefits from those important protected lands. Thank you. Same question to you, Mr. Short. Great. Flood, fires, and drought. Pardon me? Floods, fires, oh, and drought. Exactly. Sorry. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I believe that we need to address climate issues, and I, need, I believe that we need to do it in a way where we focus on affordable energy uh, and making sure that we are not energy, or making sure that we are energy independent. To me, I think looking at solutions like nuclear, uh, which is a, a baseload source of energy here in, in Illinois, makes a lot of sense. That is a green uh, source of energy. It is uh, carbon neutral, and it's, it's low cost. And so I think we need to focus on more efforts like that to do that. And then from a sustainability standpoint, uh, you know, I work very uh, hard locally to promote sustainability issues in Grays Lake as well. You know, advancing more green space for our community, looking at making it more uh, accessible and easy for residents to have solar panels, uh, you know, on their homes and in buildings. Looking at ways to make sure that we're supporting businesses with a, you know, a sustainable business award program to, to continue to promote that in the community. I also happen to work in the insurance industry, so I understand a lot about floods and fires and, and all of those things that you mentioned. And to me, it's a lot about making sure that we focus on mitigation efforts and making sure that we're doing things to get out in front of some of these events so that we don't have to suffer the consequences of disasters like we see with um, Hurricane Ian down down in Florida, you know, let's look at home hardening opportunities, looking at ways to find, uh, you know, better um, building materials to make sure that when disasters do happen, people are prepared and they're, they're ready to deal with those. Thank you. And for the next question, you will be the first respondent, Mr. Sure. Shores. And sure. I'm going to combine two questions. Now, low-income families and working-class families are not the same thing, but these are two similar questions, so I'd like to put them together. Okay. How will you address the undue burden that inflation has placed on our working class families and our low income families in this community? Yep. So I think you know the inflation issues are hitting all of us, but it especially hits uh, low income families and working class families because, and often as often as the case, uh, those families are working to make ends meet and. and going paycheck to paycheck, and that is exacerbated right now. And so a lot of the things that I talked about already is finding innovative ways to be more responsible with government spending and looking for ways to be uh, to provide savings to people, provide tax relief to people. You know, uh, for example, the gas tax relief that was just imposed, uh, that is essentially an election year gimmick, because guess what happens on January 1st? gas tax is going to go back up again. So I think we need to look at long-term meaningful solutions like that that give people the relief that they need. I also think that we need to focus, especially for low-income communities, on access to better education, access to better opportunities so that they can lift themselves up and give themselves a better opportunity. So I agree also with the evidence-based funding formula for education as it relates to additional resources that can go into underserved communities to help them, uh, providing them better technology, better better tools, better resources to put themselves on a path uh, to a successful life. Great, and I'm happy to always repeat the question, but it seems we don't really need to with two smart people up here on the stage <laughs> with me. So same question, please. Yes, uh, yes, we certainly have all um, experience the impacts of inflation, but we know um, that people, uh, low income, working class families have certainly ha uh, felt that even greater. And so there are a couple things. Number one, I do support uh, the inflation rollback measures that the uh, that the state government has um, implemented this past year, a holiday, a 
holiday sales tax on school supplies, rolling back the grocery tax, um, suspending the 1% uh, gas um, in, uh, increase this year. But those are all short-term measures, and they aren't sustainable. Long-term, we need to make work on making um, fixing our supply chain issues, which is a major cause of our inflation. The second thing we need to do is work on sustainable um, long-term solutions to our property taxes. But third, we also need to consider families, and they will be uh, working families, low-income families will be a first priority, a high priority for me when looking at budget decisions in Springfield. Dr. King said the budget is a moral document. And so what that means when I go to Springfield is I'm going to make sure and I'm going to fight for low income and working families to have much needed access to high quality health care, high quality schools, and other vital and important services. No one in our state should go hungry. No one in our state uh, should go unhoused. And I will prioritize those things in a budget. Because like I said, I think a budget is a moral document and tells your community where your values lie and what you're willing to sacrifice to meet those values. Thank you very much. And the next question will be asked by one of our student moderators. Uh, so I'd like to ask Carolina Vilchis to come up to the microphone and ask the question. Okay, our first respondent is Ms. Diaz. The question is, do you support the Safety Act, no cash back, as currently written? Great question. So first of all, there has been a lot of misinformation out there. The Daily Herald said it itself. So number one, if you're looking for actual factual data, make sure you look at reputable sources like the Daily Herald um, that point to what is actually happening in this criminal justice reform package. There are a couple of values that I have and I want to point out. The first one is that we need to, uh, public safety is top of mind for me as a mom of young children. We need to be safe and we need to feel safe in order to have thriving communities. Communities. At the same time, we must ensure that we have a just detainment process where violent people who are at risk to our community, they should go in front of a judge and there should absolutely be a process in place to detain people based on their risk to the community, not how much money they make and not how much money they have in their bank account. So when I am looking at legislation, I was not in Springfield when the Safety Act was passed, but when we move forward and I am in Springfield, I will look at those two values. Does it keep our community safe and is it a just law? Uh, the Supreme Court currently is heading a task force of Republicans, Democrats, law enforcement, victims' rights advocates, and they're looking to make sure that the intent of the bill matches the language of the bill that will not go into effect until January 1st. So we need to make sure any of those issues and kinks um, are ironed out. But at the top of my list is making sure we have safe communities and that people who don't have the resources are not uh, punished by staying in jail as compared to someone with resources. Thank you. And now the same question for Mr. Shores. Do you support the Safety Act, no cash back, as currently written? So crime in Illinois is at an all-time high. And law, department, law enforcement departments across the state are struggling to retain and recruit people to come work there. We can't find people who want to be police officers in this state. And this is before January 1st, when this law fully goes into effect. So I would absolutely vote to repeal the Safety Act. I think it is a slap in the face to law enforcement. It is a slap in the face to homeowners who deserve and expect to have a level of safety in their communities. We should not be focused on the benefits of criminals. We should be focused on making sure that our communities are safe. There's a reason why 100 out of the 102 state's attorneys and 100 out of the 102 sheriffs in Illinois oppose this law because they know that it will do a lot of havoc to our criminal justice system. It will make it easier for offenders to be out on the street. Now, I say that, and I also should say that, you know, people who uh, are arrested for minor offenses, of course we should be looking at ways to make sure there is, you know, a just system for that. We're not, we're not talking about that, but, you know, when we're talking about violent offenders, like people who are arrested for things like second degree murder, for arson, for kidnapping, I don't want them out on the street, and I certainly wouldn't think that people in our communities would either. So I would absolutely vote to repeal the Safety Act. Thank you. 
And thank you to our student moderators. In addition to the three that you see on camera, we also have students who are working as ushers in the room, we're working as greeters, and we're also manning excuse me, informational tables in the lobby. They are here at Round Lake High School in the AP Community Civics class. So thanks to the students and thanks to the high school for having us here. So. And now, I will regroup again. Uh, you know, we try to cover the subjects that the audience wants to bring to us. So um, again, I apologize, Mr. Shores, you're getting the combined question again. Great. So uh, two questions here. How do you plan to improve public education? And also, what about private schools? Should they meet the same requirements as public schools, for instance, support special ed? So I'll answer it in sort of two parts, if that's okay, a little bit. Uh, and I spoke a little bit uh, earlier about education, but I believe that the evidence-based funding formula that we have here in Illinois is a good start. Um, you know, we should be looking at ways to make sure that underserved communities have opportunity to have success and to have opportunity for those resources that I spoke about, making sure that, um, you know, we have access to technology, to, you know, um, special education needs, for sure. When we look at education funding, I believe it starts with making sure that the resources are going to the people that need them and that expect them. And those are our teachers in the classrooms and students. You know, too often we get caught up in administrative overhead and bureaucracy that funnels up money at the top level and it doesn't make it its way to where it can be most impactful. So I think we need to look at how we prioritize education funding and that would be a top priority for me. In terms of school choice, and can you just remind me what the what the part of that question was? Um, well, specifically, special ed was mentioned, but should private schools have the same requirements as public schools? I do believe there should be some standards for private schools that are in line with um, public education, but I also believe fundamentally in the opportunity to make sure that um, you know uh, parents and students have a choice to meet their individual education needs. And that's really at the end of the day what we're talking about is making sure that we're focused on the benefit of the individual student, that they get the quality education that they need for how that works for them. All right, same question, Ms. Faber-Diaz. Thank you. Um, so I am pr um, passionate about high quality education. Um, I taught in an under-resourced district uh, for nearly a decade. I had 23 textbooks, American history textbooks, for 120 students. The inequity in public schools is real, and it ex even exists within District 62. So I, it is something that is at the top of my list to fight for high quality education, public education for every student. That includes special education. I have a son with significant dyslexia, and I have seen how the teacher shortage is directly affecting his education. So we have to support um, teacher recruitment efforts. We have to pay our teachers well and we have to provide them a retirement um, that meets their needs as well. So we have to address this teacher shortage. We need to continue the work of the evidence-based funding formula. Five years later, there are still 1.7 million Illinois students in 83% of school districts that are not at their adequacy funding targets. So we absolutely have to prioritize that in the budget. In terms of private schools, uh, yes, they need to be held to the same standards. If they are not, then they should not be uh, getting taxpayer dollars. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Favor Diaz, you will be the first respondent to this question. The county supports a statewide ban on assault weapons. Will you support this? Why or why not? I am especially concerned with the rise in gun violence in schools. We must remove violence from our schools. Absolutely. Um, I was a teacher. I was teaching in Sandy Hook. I will never forget uh, when the teacher next door came in my classroom and told me what had happened. Um, and then I had to drop off my boys um, at school after the Evalde shooting with my um, heart in my stomach, thinking about the risk of sending my children into public schools. We have to stand up to the gun lobby. Uh, you know, I grew up in a home uh, with guns. My dad is an avid sportsman. He's an avid hunter. He was a law-abiding citizen, and I support his and Illinois' right uh, uh, law-abiding gun owners to own firearms, but assault weapons were literally created to destroy people in war situations, and I do not think they should be in the hands of everyday people. They belong in the military, they have their place in war, but not in everyday hands. So that's the first thing that I want to do. I've been endorsed by the Gun Violence Prevention Pack, Every Town for Gun Safety. We need to strengthen background checks. 
We need to strengthen red flag laws. There is a lot of real work to do. Active shooter drills are not a solution to school shootings. Teaching our children where to run and how to hide is not how we need to address gun violence. And it's time that we stand up to the gun lobby and we protect law-abiding rights owners to firearms, to go hunt handguns. But we absolutely need an assault, uh, a ban on assault weapons and high-capacity magazines. Thank you. We have some clapping in the auditorium for those of you who are viewing this on tape. Uh, we hope that we can move on without an audience response, but thank you for your enthusiasm. So same question, Mr. Shores. Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, my youngest son, Cooper, is the same age as those students who were killed in Uvalde. And I can't imagine what that must be like to be a parent to have dropped your child off at school and then realize later that day that you're not gonna see them again. So I agree that we need to look at what we do to make sure that our students, our schools, our entire families are safe. Any proposal that would come to my desk uh, down in Springfield, I would look at and review thoroughly and thoughtfully. I think we need to do two things first. We need to focus on the illegal guns that we know about here in Illinois and get them off the street. There are thousands of people in Illinois who have a revoked FOID card, yet they still own their weapons. We need to go after those that we know are out there and get them off the street. I think it's something like something in uh, 20,000 guns in Cook County alone that we need to go after. We also need to look at our red flag law. And I support our red flag law, but I wanna make sure it's supporting us. I wanna make sure that it is fully funded so that law enforcement and parents and people in the community have a good understanding, good education, and good training about how that law works to keep us all safe. And that would be a top priority for me. Excellent, well we do have time for a few more questions and if we don't get to yours, I apologize. Uh, the next question, which uh, Mr. Shores will answer first, shifting gears a little bit, we're talking about property taxes now. One of the major complaints are the high property taxes in Illinois. Of course, property taxes provide funding for schools, police, fire, and infrastructure improvements. What solutions do you see to address the concerns of our residents? Well, the solution is to do what I did locally, which is to lower property taxes. Every year that I was on the village board, I voted to either freeze or reduce uh, the village's portion of uh, property tax levy. And that's a small amount when you compare it to the overall uh, element. But to me, it's the philosophy of taking an approach to be a good steward of taxpayer money and looking for ways to find innovative solutions to re reduce uh, tax burden and, and put money back in people's pockets. What I believe we need to do down in Springfield is uh, look at ways to make sure that the state can put more of its skin in the game when it comes to funding our local schools. But the way to do that is to make sure that lawmakers in Springfield aren't financing pet projects with an inflated budget that doesn't allow for those resources to go to schools. The fiscal year budget for 2023 has revenue that is down 5%, but spending is up 10%. That math doesn't add up, and that's the problem that we're facing. When we have massive pension debt, we've got other responsibilities, like funding our schools, we need to make sure that we're doing that. Thank you, same question. Yes, so I think the root of property taxes um, and the reason that they are so high is because of the way, uh, like I said earlier, the way we fund public schools in Illinois. We are behind states that you never wanna be behind. We need to make sure, and it will be a top budget priority, that we are funding our public schools. In the evidence-based funding f formula that was passed in 2017, Illinois has increased its share, uh, its share of the funding from 24 to 27%. But that is not nearly enough. The state needs to do more when it comes to funding our public schools and at the same time ensuring that we have continue high quality public schools, which is a reason that companies are locating and will continue to locate to Illinois, which ties into the second solution, which is to grow our commercial tax base to offset our local residential property taxes. We need to be innovative. We need to be aggressive. We need we have uh, attracted top tier talent here in Lake County.
County. In 2021, uh, Lake County became the second highest concentration in the Midwest of Fortune 500 companies. And that's largely due to our high quality public schools, our high quality of life, and our strong transportation system. So we need to emphasize those and we need to aggressively recruit companies that have a future, which is why I am so invested in looking towards the future um, and, and companies in the green technology sector that can combat climate change and at the same time provide high skilled, high wage jobs and tax revenue that we can use in Springfield to offset our local property tax dollars. Okay, thank you. So we're moving on to a new question. Uh, Laura Favor Dias, you will be first. What is your opinion on union organizing bargaining rights and the establishment of unions in public and private sectors? Yeah, so if you look at the uh, the rights that we have in the workplace that we take uh, for granted every day, a five-day work week, a 40-hour work week, safety conditions, all of those were hard fought literally with the blood, sweat, and tears of union organizers. So I absolutely support uh, people's rights to organize. I used to have a, um, a bumper sticker that said the labor union, uh, the folks who brought you the weekend. So I absolutely uh, support people people's rights to organize, to collectively come to, uh, together, and to um, demand better wages, um, better employment conditions um, from, from their corporations and from their employers. We see disproportionate wages when it comes to what CEOs have been making in the last 20 to 30 years as compared to the bottom of the wage uh, worker. We need to make sure that the people at the bottom have power against uh, corporate price gouging against these CEOs with ridiculous salaries. And the way that we can do that is protecting people's rights to organize and collectively stand up and collectively bargain. Thank you, Mr. Shores. Thank you. <clears throat> I support the right of people to collectively bargain. And I think that unions do have a role to play uh, in, our, um, in our economy. Uh, but I also would say that I oppose the proposed constitutional amendment, Amendment 1, because I don't think that it will really do anything. It doesn't affect private sector unions. Uh, Illinois' uh, labor laws are quite expansive, and there's a lot of uh, resources and information already put into Illinois law that supports public sector unions. And this proposed constitutional amendment, in my opinion, will do things to unfairly tip the balance over to public employee unions. And I think it will do it at the expense of taxpayers because it will hinder the ability of municipalities and governments to bargain in good faith because they won't be allowed to necessarily do that. And they that, that then means that local taxes will go up and your local property taxes are gonna go up because of that. Thank you, and final question. So this question will go first to Mr. Shores. Oh, time for campaign promises, I guess. It says, how will you keep your constituents informed and how will you get their input? prior to a decision on the work being discussed at the state level, and also how will you do this for your constituents who are Spanish speaking? Sure, great, well thank you so much. Um, so I have a, a professional background in communications, and so I understand how important it is to connect with people. And when I'm out talking to people at their doorstep, I don't start with my spiel about, here's a, I'm Adam Shores and here's what I wanna do. The very first thing I ask them is, what issue do you care most about and what's on your mind? And I think that is fundamental to how you need to be as a representative, is you have to hear people and listen to them and get their feedback because that informs how you do your job. And so fundamentally and principally, that's how I would approach my work. To me, I think it's being an engaged legislator and being in the community and making sure that you're out talking to people, going to events, having an open dialogue. I would have a staff and I would put my staff's priority to make sure that they're responding to constituent services and making sure that we're answering and addressing people, especially from all walks of life and from all parts of our community, especially here in the Round Lake area and, and from the, the, the standpoint of um, you know, uh, dealing with Spanish speaking constituents. I don't speak Spanish myself, but I would make it a priority to have staff members who would, um, who can help make sure that we're properly addressing needs of all people in our community. Super, thank you so much. Same question. Yes, so um, what I have loved about serving as a Grays Lake Village trustee is connecting with people. I have been engaged um, and active. I've hosted multiple community events, um, bike rides, um, 
Uh, I did a walk with a trustee around Central Park uh, every day for a month last year. It was wonderful to get to know people. So you absolutely have to be engaging with your community, and I would continue to do that. I also have experience um, working as a district director for a state legislator and setting up a strong uh, district office that helps people navigate um, all of the nuances of government. Uh, you know, it, it, it was interesting. I was knocking a door, and this woman was in absolute tears. This is recently about um, her son not be her disabled son um, and his lack of access um, to Medicare. And I said, you know, have you reached out um, to any of your elected officials? And um, she did. And she later got back in touch with me. And because of a district office um, in our community, this woman was able to get her son the much needed medicine um, that he needs every month. It was amazing to see this mom was in tears. I was in tears. It was incredible. We have to be intentional um, in creating communication. We have to meet people where they are. Um, and it doesn't mean just being in our office. It means setting up satellite locations for people to come and ask questions and meet us and make sure that they are getting the sort resources and the services uh, that they need. And that's one of um, the parts of the job that I am most looking forward to. Thank you very much. We're now ready to go to, oh, there's our timer. We're now ready to go to closing statements, which the candidates were able to prepare in advance. And this time, Adam Shores will go first. Great. And I'm just going to sit here if that's okay. Great. Whatever. <clears throat> so well, again, thank you all so much for the opportunity to come and share my story with you a little bit and, and hear your questions and concerns. Uh, I, I've really appreciated this forum and this opportunity. And thank you, Laura, as well. Uh, you know, um, when I think about why I'm running for office, I'm reminded of a quote uh, from uh, President George Bush who said that no definition of a successful life can do anything but include serving others. And the principle behind that is really important to me because to me it's all about what you do to help people and help others. I also think of my 90-year-old grandfather who is the hero of my life. And he has taught me everything that I know about what it means to be a leader. And he has told me that the mark of a good leader is someone who listens more and talks less. That is the approach that I will take in Springfield is to listen to you more and work on your behalf to do good things for you. I am an independent-minded, issue-oriented leader with experience. I've got a record of doing things and getting things done in our community. And that's the kind of voice that I believe that we need down in Springfield. I believe a better Illinois is ahead of us, and I believe that together we can get there. Thank you so much. Thank you for that applause. We have another closing statement now from Laura Favor Dias. Um, one of my favorite lessons to teach when I was teaching American history uh, was about the uh, framing of our Constitution. So it was the summer of 1783, and the framers were locked away for six weeks in Independence Hall in the sweltering summer sun in July. And as they ended the Constitutional Convention, Ben Franklin exited Independence Hall, and a reporter called out to him and said, what have you created in there? And he responded, a republic if you can keep it. So I want to thank everyone tonight for showing up for these organizations, for helping to keep our republic. Informed, engaged, civic action is so important. So thank you to Mano Amano, the NAACP Lake County, Round Lake Public Library, Round Lake High School, the League of Women Voters, Mariposa's Women's Collective. I think I've got them all. But thank you all so much for the work you do in our community and providing this informative um, civic uh, education opportunity. Um, we've discussed tonight lots of challenges that we face um, in our state and the role that our state plays in our collective nation. And so I I think we need a fighter in Springfield who will stand for our values, for our communities, for our families, and who just won't go with the status quo um, and claim there's, there's nothing about this that I can do. We need people who are aligned with your values. My name is Laura Favor Dias. I think I'm the right person for the job. And if you do too, I would appreciate your vote in November. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. This has been a wonderful collaboration, as you can see, between many groups. Thanks especially to the Round Lake High School kids who have been helping.
the kids who have been helping not just tonight, but helped to plan this event. So uh, an exercise in government, and thanks to you too, the same exercise in government. Uh, much as we get frustrated with government, I'm always impressed with the quality of people who want to serve us. It, it's just an astonishing act of optimism. Thank you. <laughs> so our democracy depends on everybody, including you, all of us to be involved and informed. And I would like to direct your attention to the IllinoisVoterGuide.org. This is a web page you can go to. You can enter your address. You will see who you will vote for. You'll see your ballot, and you'll see the candidates' positions on issues. Uh, much more fun to be here live tonight, but you can also read at home online if you go to IllinoisVoterGuide.org. We depend on you to make government work, to make democracy work. So thank you, and good night. <laughs>